Alrighty. Well, welcome everyone. I'm so glad you could all make it today, tonight, this evening. I know everyone's schedules are really busy. Um, for those of you who don't know me or not so well, my name is Dr. Carrie Raymond. I'm a naturopathic physician here at Hawthorne Healing Arts Center. And tonight, as you can see, we're going to be talking about menopause, which is an interesting topic because we all talk about menopause and there's some misconceptions about what that actually is because really menopause is a split second in time when all of a sudden you have that anniversary of one year, no cycle, boom, you're, you're menopause and then all of a sudden you're post your postmenopause before that split second your peri so really menopause is just a very short time <laughs> that split second when you hit that one year anniversary 12 months of no period and everything before that is perimenopause and everything after that is menopause now the symptoms of all three of those can be far reaching you know, from the typical things you hear about, like hot flashes, night sweats, things like that, to wanting to throttle someone, getting very emotional, mood swings, stuff like that, um, brain fog, concentration, you know, getting challenging, all kinds of things. So we're going to talk a little bit about that tonight. But the main gist of what we're going to be talking about is how to get through this whole period easily so that it's not so challenging because it doesn't have to be hard. It doesn't have to be horrible. And I'm sure you've all heard from friends or relatives that have been on the full spectrum of everything in between from well, like what I was describing with wanting to kill somebody to all of a sudden they just never had a period and never came back and they were just completely fine. So, um, how do you get to be that person? <laughs> that's, that's our goal tonight, is to, to get through that. Because with some good preparation and a little bit of work, you can actually get through this part of your life quite unscathed and have it be a lot easier than it, than it needs to be. And those, you know, what's sometimes frustrating to me as a physician because I generally see the ones that have the hard time because why would they be seeking help? Um, the ones that don't have a hard time sometimes don't have that much empathy for the people who have a hard time because they don't get it. You know, what do you mean you're having a rough time? Uh, you know, I never had a hard time at all. What are you talking about? So, anyway. Any questions so far? I'll try and um, move fairly quickly so that we have some time for questions at the end. So the whole concept here is balance. We're trying to achieve a balance and what we're trying to balance is our hormones. And you think about the times that your hormones have a problem, puberty. Right? You know, when you're going through puberty, massive ups and downs in your hormones. Pregnancy, if any of you have had kids, you'll remember some of the hormonal ups and downs about that. Um, and then PMS, you know, even just throughout a, a monthly cycle, the hormonal ups and downs. And so your hormones are going up and down on a daily basis, as well as a monthly basis, as well as, you know, a lifetime basis. And so what we're trying to do is balance those. Um, and so things that we can do or things that are going to affect that, our body composition, meaning how much percentage fat do we have, um, our blood sugar and insulin, because that's got to do with our cortisol and you know how we sometimes get this little muffin top thing going. <laughs> uh, <laughs> healthy estrogen metabolism, because estrogen and other hormones seem to be at the crux of this. Um, and so if we're having problems with balancing all these things, then we start having issues like PMS, IBS, which is irritable bowel syndrome, and symptoms and inflammation. 
So endocrinology is just the study of hormones. And so there's lots of different hormones. I mean, we have thyroid hormones, we have sex hormones, we have adrenal hormones, digestive hormones. There's lots of things to try and balance. And you know, you think of endocrinologists, which is a lot of what I do as a naturopath, is trying to balance these hormones because we're working with basically three different um, organ systems, our thyroid, our adrenals, and our ovaries for women, and for guys, their testes. So you're trying to balance those three together, and they're trying to help each other. And so we've got to really work trying to help both or all three of those. So this, and I'll refer back to this a, a couple of times, um, I usually have a, um, Oh, what do you call those plastic coated, you know, sheet of paper that you have? See, this is what happens during menopause. You can't <laughs> find the words. <laughs> um, anyway, like a card, you know. And so I used to be a school teacher. I'm all about visual aids, and so. Um, yes, thank you, Lisa. Okay, so you can see the basic building block here is cholesterol. And cholesterol gets labeled the bad guy. Like, oh, cholesterol, you know, we don't want cholesterol. The problem is, think of people who have problems with hormones like not being enough, like infertility, um, especially people with uh, low percentage body fat who train a lot, like marathon runners and gymnasts and stuff like that, and then they have problems having a period because they're hor they don't have enough hormones, and so they don't have enough cholesterol. And so, you know, once they quit training and you know get back to more uh, of a healthy lifestyle, this all um, falls into place better. Another time I see this is people on um, lipid-lowering drugs, um, and I tend to see it more in guys where they're taking Lipitor or something like that and it's lowering their cholesterol, but indirectly, it's lowering their testosterone, and they feel horrible. And so, if you know anyone in that position, have them get their testosterone checked, and we can check that here and figure out, you know, because sometimes the cholesterol's too low, and, you know, anything under 160 is too, too low. So, then we go downstream, we make pregnenolone, progesterone, this is coming from uh, the adrenals, DHEA, and uh, corticosteroids like cortisol, also from the adrenals. Um, and you can see here, this is what we call more the androgen pathway or the male hormone pathway. But this is the same for men and women. It's just different levels. Like we don't have as much testosterone as men, and they don't have as much, much estrogen and progesterone as women. But we still use these same pathways, and then we have estradiol, and it comes down to estriol. So if you imagine this is turning into this, into this, into this, and sometimes it's got to go somewhere. Like it's got to actually leave your body. If, if this keeps recycling in your body, it ends up in your tissues like um, uterine fibroids, polycystic ovarian syndrome, fibrocystic breasts. And so we, we need to be making sure that not only it's following this, but leaving your body and going out someplace else. So Lisa's looking at her lab saying, where is FSH? <laughs> So there's different ways we can figure out, are you in balance? You know, uh, like you can tell in your body, okay, you know, something's up here and this isn't good. But there's things that we can do to figure out, okay, are we in balance or not? So regular blood chemistry, like a uh, Chem 14 or a comprehensive metabolic panel, it's just a regular blood test that's looking at your liver and your kidneys. Um, but with the electrolytes, we can look at your adrenals and see if they're being compromised. Um, thyroid testing, and we like to check all three, uh, free T3, free T4, and TSH. Um, a female hormone panel, this is uh, a saliva test that's looking at estrogen, progesterone, and FSH and all these things. Um, we can also do these with blood. Um, 
an adrenal stress index, that's what this ASI is, and again, this is a saliva test. And the reason this is nice is because we can check cortisol four times during a day instead of just a morning uh, wake up cortisol fasting. We can actually see what your cortisol is doing throughout a day instead of just at one time because your cortisol should be high in the morning and low at night so that you can sleep. Cortisol is kind of like adrenaline, you know, if you're bouncing off the walls, that's not good. You can have too much, you can have too little, and if you have too little, you don't function well. You don't get out of bed in the morning. <laughs> you don't feel good at all. Um, bone markers, uh, this is an, called an entelopeptide, and it's looking for calcium loss in the urine. This is another way to check for um, bone density. Uh, so when you get a DEXA scan, which is a, a bone density scan, it's something you do maybe every five years. If you have osteopenia or osteoporosis, you might want to check how things are going more often than every five years. And this is a, a cheap test, it's about 60 bucks, um, that you can see if the things you're doing are working. Um, digestion tests and all the regular kind of exams like a pelvic exam. So when I do an annual exam, a, a pelvic exam, I can assess the tissue and tell you if you have enough vaginal estrogen because if you don't, we can help that topically. It's very easy and so it doesn't have to be uncomfortable, it doesn't have to be dry. Um, a breast exam to check if you have fibrocystic breasts, if there's anything going on. A, a clinical breast exam, I recommend that people get both of these on a yearly basis. It doesn't mean you have to do a pap every year. Um, same with a mammogram. It's not standard of care to do a mammogram every year now, um, but it depends on a lot of things. So if you see a physician and have an annual exam with someone like myself, then we'll look at your family history, look at your risk factors, do a clinical breast exam, and let you know what the interval should be for getting a mammogram. Um, the PAPs we talked about, you know, pelvic ultrasounds, biopsies, and CA125 is a ovarian tumor marker for ovarian cancer. It's not something you have to keep redoing if you've done it once. Uh, it's a pretty, and it's negative, it's all good, it's a pretty good indicator that everything's good. What kind of test is that? It's a blood test. And if it comes back higher, it, it doesn't necessarily mean you have ovarian cancer, it just means you have some inflammation and something going on with the ovaries and so then you need to investigate further. So bioidentical hormones, I heard you mention that you're taking some estrogen. Um, so there's different ways to take hormones. So there's hormones uh, that are what we call bioidentical, meaning they're exactly the same as what we found in our body. So um, you know, you could compare your estrogen or your progesterone to anybody else and it's all going to have the same chemical um, molecular composition. Uh, the reason we like to use what we call bioidentical is, you know, there's not as many side effects. It's the same as what's found in your body, so why not use the same thing? Why use something that's different? Um, and it's you can have a natural hormone, but it's not necessarily bioidentical. It doesn't look exactly the same as what's in your body. So for example, like Premarin is estrogen from pregnant mares, horses, urine. And so it's not the same estrogen that's found in our body. It's horse estrogen. And it's not necessarily bad, but it's not the same as what's in us. So I choose to, if I'm going to do hormones, to use bioidentical hormones rather than um, st stuff like that. So I'll show you, this is an example with progesterone. So you don't have to be a chemical chemist or no organic chemistry to worry about this. You just look at these are, are pretty much the same. But then they added this side chain here and this is Provera which is what used to be Prempro is Premarin and Provera together. 
the estrogen from the horses with the Provera. And it's a progestin. It's not actually progesterone because it's different than what's in your body. And the only reason they make it different is because they want to put a patent on it and sell it and make money. Because this, you can't put a patent on it. Well, unless you're on Monsanto, but maybe I shouldn't say that. <laughs> um, so this is the progesterone in uh, the progestin in a birth control pill. And you can see they cut off this top chain here, put a hydroxy group on there, and then put that other side chain on there. So you can imagine your body knows the difference between this and this. And it reacts a little differently. And so when you take progesterone for a particular symptom, like for example, uh, one, if I do go down the road of doing hormonal therapy, progesterone is one of the first ones that I do because it's the first one to drop. It's the one that's controlling your cycle, the timing of your cycle. And so when things get wacky, it's because your progesterone's dropping. It's the first one to kind of drop out. And so it's kind of the first one that I start to introduce. Um, and if you're doing, like I'll often use it for sleep. Uh, if you use it in a particular form and use it at night, it can really help you with sleep. But if you took a progestin for the same thing, it probably wouldn't work the same way. So we just need to be careful you know, of how we're using these. And we still use these, and other people still use them, and they're not exactly bad, but if I had a choice, I would always go for what's bioidentical. Um, Oh, look at this. What, so what is the bioidentical? Where are, they get, where are you getting that? They're still uh, making... I'm sorry to interrupt, but if you wouldn't mind repeating the questions, that would be great. Okay. So uh, the question was where a bioidentical hormones coming from. Is that yeah. pretty much the gist? Um, often they're getting made from a natural substance. Like, for example, progesterone comes from Mexican wild yams. So it's coming from a, a natural substance. You think, okay, what's a Mexican wild yam got to do with my female body? But they can make the, the same hormone that looks exactly the same progesterone as what's in your body from that thing. So, and they do the same with estrogens and with other stuff. It's not a pregnant woman's urine. <laughs> it's not from pregnant <laughs> women's Isn't urine. Is there something with the wild yam though that's not absorbable or there has to be some other component with it to make it more absorbable or something? Uh, well, I guess it depends on what form you're using it in because you can often get progesterone in creams, you can get progesterone made in different ways. But if it's OMP, it, it's uh, it's particularly, it's, uh, what do they call it, the, the, f <sighs> what is it, Josh, help me out here, the OMP stands for, uh, it's the pharmacopoeia, right. it's, it's like the right. U.S. USP, United States Standard. Yeah, and so, um, you know, everything that every batch that's manufactured is all exactly the same. And so not every progesterone product is USP progesterone. But if it's going through a pharmacy, it, it is. But you can buy progesterone over the counter. Yeah. Creams, you know. But if you were getting capsules or sublinguals that came from a compounding pharmacy, then you can be sure that that's, you know, the right stuff. And, you know, some cosmetics have progesterone in them and they don't even put it on the label. Or they put it on the label and they don't even tell you how much is in there. So I would steer clear of products like that. Did that kind of answer your question? Yeah. Yeah, I don't think it's coming from the Mexican Wild Yam. I think it's how it's actually put together whether, you know, how it's synthesized in your body. Okay. Because you can take it orally, you can take it sublingually, you can do drops, you can do creams, and there's different theories. You know, some people like creams, some people don't. Um, because it's avoiding the, what we call the first pass, it's not going through your gut, and so if you have compromised digestion, uh, then that's a good thing. You know, you can go straight into the bloodstream. But 
others feel like, well, it's hard to know how much is going in because, you know, going through your skin is hard to know. And, and so, you know, there's still controversy about that. Did that yeah, yeah. sort of answer your question? Um, so we talk about different hormones and we, we talk a lot about estrogen because estrogen balance seems to be important and progesterone and estrogen kind of play this game together where uh, where you need the progesterone in a ratio that's more than the estrogen. And so if there's not enough progesterone and there's more estrogen than progesterone, then we call that estrogen dominance. And so things that we can do to make sure that we're getting optimal estrogen balance is getting the right nutrition. So micro and macronutrients, basically we're talking about macronutrients are like proteins and carbs and uh, fats. And the micronutrients are like the vitamins, like, you know, vitamin B or calcium and things like that. Am I getting that right, Lisa? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm, I'm sidetracked those flash behind me. So. Oh, yes. Um, insulin resistance. Are you guys familiar with insulin resistance? Uh, nodding head sideways. So when we eat sugar, we need to get the sugar into the cells. And it doesn't just kind of soak in. It needs uh, something to actually take it in. To, like We talk about it being a key. So the insulin is like a key to open the door to let the glucose in. And so if you have a lot of sugar, which can happen with a lot of cortisol, like drinking coffee in the morning and getting a big rush and having something that's got lots of sugar, uh, then you get all this insulin and after a while there's too much insulin and your cells become what we call resistant, meaning the insulin doesn't work, it doesn't open the door, the sugar doesn't get in, and that's what we call type 2 diabetes. And so diabetes means the sugar doesn't get into the cell and it's you got a lot of sugar running around in your blood. Does that make sense so far? So diabetics have high blood glucose, but they're starving inside because they can't get the sugar into the cell, right? And so this can happen really easily with high cortisol um, and uh, estrogen imbalance. And so we just want to make sure that we're taking care of not getting high rushes of sugar. So, can be caused by coffee in the morning? Oh yeah. Well, and eating something that's got high sugar because you're increasing the cortisol, you're increasing the insulin, you're you're in fight or flight. <coughs> morning. <laughs> yeah. Body composition. Here we're talking about having good muscle mass. Um, and keeping your percentage fat within you know good levels. Aromatase activity. This is the enzyme that helps your body convert testosterone to estrogen. If we go back to that, um, oh, this one here. Uh, Actually, I don't know why there's not. A, there should be an arrow down here between testosterone and estradiol. And so with a lot of men, they convert very quickly what testosterone they have to estradiol too quickly. And so now they have lots of estradiol. And you see men who have, you know, we call them man boobs or you know, we call it gynomastia, which, you know, they sh they shouldn't have breasts, but you know some guys do, and um, that's where they're not getting enough testosterone. They're converting everything very quickly to estradiol, and that's an aromatase problem, which is what. Uh, da, 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 da. Which is what this is talking about. Reduce the aromatase activity so you're not converting so quickly. Um, improved bowel health, ecology, and the supply factor shown to assist in the excretion of estrogen. So like we were talking about before, that estrogen has got to go somewhere. We've got to get rid of it. And the way we get rid of it is through uh, our liver actually filtering it out 
from our blood and then it going out through our pee and our poop. So this is where the crux is where I'm going to get to in a second. Um, and this healthy 2 hydroxy to 16 alpha hydroxy ratio, it's talking about the kind of estrogen that gets recycled versus the kind of estrogen that we want to get out of our body. And the 2 hydroxy gets out much easier. And so we want it to be go more towards that. And there's things that we can do in our diet to uh, shuttle things more this way. So estrogen dominance is when the progesterone is too low. So we see that a lot with PMS, um, people with uh, tender breasts, cravings, um, heavy periods, insomnia, fibroids, weight gain. I mean, who hasn't had any of these things? So, <laughs> so estrogen dominance is quite common. Although I think I often tend to think that it's always the problem and it's not always the problem. But it's definitely the first go-to for me is to make sure that we're dealing with uh, that balance between the estrogen and progesterone. But when we get into perimenopause, the, the reason this is a problem is because the progesterone is the first one to drop. So we start dropping the progesterone, so then now the estrogen is more in relation to how much progesterone we had. So that's why some of these things can happen. This isn't so common, but I've seen it happen, and so if you you know, think you fit this bill, then consider this. And I've seen it in cosmetics where people didn't know they were getting it. And so if you if you don't think you're taking progesterone but you think you have too much, um, have a look at some of the cosmetics like just facial creams and stuff that it might be in. Um you called something else? Uh, well, Mexican wild yam. Yeah. What, what are the side effects for uh, too much progesterone? Depression, Depression PMS. Okay. Yeah. DHEA. This is another over the counter hormone. You can, <laughs> Lisa's excited because it's on her labs. Um, so you can, uh, the government has deemed this safe enough and that we can just go buy it over the counter if we so please. But if you remember, back on that um, androgen pathway, yee, there it is, here, look what it turns into, testosterone, which is sometimes a good thing if I want to uh, bring up someone's testosterone, especially a woman without actually giving them testosterone, then um, DHEA can be, can be a good way to do it, although you can see that sometimes it doesn't actually go where you want it to. But, um, you know, it's, it can also be a problem if you're doing too much of it because, again, you can get too much testosterone and you don't want too much of that either. So, Okay, where were we? DHEA. So they call it the anti-aging hormone, and so it, you know a lot of people take it because they think, oh, it's gonna you know be good, and I'll be younger, and and it's an adrenal hormone. It can really help with. Uh, adrenal balance and with energy and all that kind of stuff. Um, so, you know, look at all these things. Wouldn't that be great? But again, you got to be careful. You don't want to have too much of it or you're going to have too much testosterone. Testosterone. Um, I re-listened to this just a little while ago. Anyone listen to Ira Glass, This American Life? Mm -hmm. You can go back in. He does a, it's a radio show on NPR. And you can go to the website and listen to previous episodes. And so I just typed in testosterone, and they did a whole episode on testosterone. And one of the stories was about a guy who had no testosterone. Like he, he had actually gone to zero. And he said it was very interesting life with no testosterone. And then when they resupplemented it back, life 
back with testosterone was very different. And he called it desire. And not so much from a sexual meaning, like libido and stuff like that, although a lot of people talk about that as far as a testosterone thing, but more about just caring about stuff. He said, I could watch the TV or a movie or something and just not really care or be interested whatsoever. You know, I have no emotion at all. I see it more being involved with motivation. So just being motivated to actually do something with your day rather than, eh, I don't care. You know, so it's almost like depression in a little sense. Um, but, you know, we also talk about it for muscle strength, you know, like tea. People are taking tea and, you know, as in testosterone for, uh, you know, bodybuilding and stuff like that. Um, but we're using it uh, sometimes topically for incontinence. So we're using it vaginally to help rebuild uh, the pelvic floor so that it can help with uh, urinary continence. Um, it, there's different ideas about whether it helps with bone density. Same with progesterone, whether it helps with bone density. Estrogen, they say, helps with bone density. So, you know, having hormones is good for bone density. So the things that, you know, our regular life presents us, you know, is a struggle to balance all these things. You know, our, our bodies are losing progesterone and testosterone and DHEA as we get older every day. It's, that's a fact of life. That's normal and typical. But what are we going to do about it? Um, as our progesterone goes down, our estrogen in relation it's not necessarily going up, but the ratio in comparison is going up. Um, other hormones may be imbalanced, not enough testosterone. Um, and we can also be putting more estrogen in our bodies through xenoestrogens. So things like plastics. So everything from plastic bags, plastic bottles, you know, carpets, paints. Fumes, all that stuff. Is that kind of BPA? Yes. Okay. Yes. And so I have this handout that um, you guys can pass around. And uh, it basically talks about the problems with plastics and how you can try and get them out of your world as much as you can. Um, you know, things like even, you know, people talk about hormones in food, you know, like in uh, meat and stuff like that. But it's not, yes, you know, there's sometimes injected growth hormones and things like that. But the other thing, if you are really serious about trying to balance your hormones, uh, trying to cut down the amount of animal protein or fats, because it all has hormones. They have their own hormones, right? And we're eating them, and so we're getting theirs as well. So, um, but yeah, just trying to get organic stuff, trying to, you know, eat healthy, avoiding the plastics, you know, all of that stuff. Uh, so, <laughs> things that we can do to help with hormone balance. So on our diet side, you know, decreasing these things. So there's, I think, like three or four slides that are worth writing down, and this is one of them. So <laughs> uh, alcohol, alcohol can be a vasodilator. I mean, have you ever drank alcohol and you start to sweat? So if you're having what we call vasomotor symptoms, like hot flashes, night sweats, alcohol is going to make it worse. For sure. <laughs> so that nice glass of red wine, I'm not saying don't drink it, but just know that you could be suffering later. Caffeine, same thing. You have a cup of coffee or a cup of tea, it's going to make you sweat. And even herbal teas, like ginger is a diaphoretic, meaning it'll make you sweat. So if you are prone to having hot flashes, then that's probably not the drink you want to drink. Um, salt can do the same thing, all of these things. 
So the things you want to eat, all the good stuff, fruit, veggies, legumes like peas, beans, lentils, stuff like that, nuts, seeds, fish, flax. So trying to get these nutrients, these are essential fatty acids. GLA is gamma linoleic acid, which is like borage or evening primrose. Um, and EPA is like uh, in fish oil. So, so those we want up or down? Those are the things we want, yes. Yes, vitamin. Dairy is a vasodilator. It's, that's what it's, no, I didn't say it's a vasodilator, but uh, it's saying that these things in your diet are going to impact your 